Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So, um, as you know, on this channel I like to feature um, weapons from around the world, not just Europe, even if there is um, often a European focus on the weapons here. And uh, this is a particularly interesting piece. And I have to confess, I have for basically my entire life been interested in edged weapons, and I was not familiar with this edged weapon at all. And it comes to me thanks to my uh, patron, um, Alex Cheng. So thank you very, very much to Alex Cheng um, for sending this. Uh, I won't say where from uh, for a second, but thank you very much to Alex. Uh, he's one of my Patreon patrons. Um, and apart from sending me this to feature on the channel and try out, we're going to be doing a little bit of testing with it as well, see what, put it through its paces. Um, this is a traditionally um, made example from the place, which I'll tell you about in a second. But um, apart from that, Alex has also done this amazing um, article and uh, research. Where, so link below uh, is a link to Alex's article. If you want to learn more about this weapon and the people who used and still use it, uh, then go and give that a read now. So this weapon is from um, Taiwan. That's right, from Taiwan. And I didn't really know very much about Taiwanese weapons um, until this was sent to me um, by Alex. And um, this goes by many names. So one of the first challenges I had was I said to Alex, well, what do I call it? Uh, and he went, ah. <laughs> and uh, the problem is, is that uh, Taiwan, uh, where this comes from, the Aboriginal people of Taiwan, are many, many different uh, tribal groupings with their own languages. Some of them are uh, related uh, linguistically linguistically and culturally, some of them are less related. Um, and so therefore, this has a lot of different names. We could just call this a Taiwanese uh, knife or a tribal Taiwan, a Taiwan knife. Um, but there are a couple of names which just looking online, um, I can find examples of these. And they're usually referred to as a, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, I'm sure, as either a la lao La Lao, and that seems to be the most common pronunciation or common uh, name for them, or a Ping Poo. Uh, so I did find it referred to as a Ping Poo as well. Um, uh, so, but usually La Lao is how they're usually called. So I'm going to call it a La Lao in this uh, video and probably forevermore because I can remember La Lao better than I can remember Ping Poo. I've had to write down Ping Poo to remember that name. So, um, the Lalao is, as you can see, it is a large knife and it has some interesting features. We will, we will look at its features in a minute. Um, but uh, going to the history, to the context, the meaty context of this, um, of this knife. So the Taiwanese Aboriginal people were the indigenous people, as far as we can tell, the first modern humans to live in this area, um, it, it, what we now know as Taiwan. And they were many, many different tribal groupings, some of whom had alliances, some of whom hated each other. Uh, just like most areas in the world, they were made up of lots of small tribal groups until other larger um, nations and states and empires came along and essentially colonised that area. And we often talk about colonialisation, I think, especially in the modern world. And certainly in the West, we often talk about colonialization um, or colonialism rather as a, a sort of European thing. So we talk about British colonialism or French colonialism. But actually in Taiwan, it's a good example of the fact um, that it, it wasn't only European powers uh, throughout history who've colonialized other areas. It, it colonized other areas. It is every empire, basically, well, most empires anyway. I can't think of any big examples of any empires that haven't colonised their neighbours, subjugated their neighbours uh, and conquered and so on. That's kind of how you end up with countries and states and empires in the first place, isn't it? So the Chinese uh, colonised a lot of areas and one of those um, was Taiwan. So it's very clear that Taiwan has had a very, very long uh, interaction with um, various Chinese dynasties. Um, and in fact, in relatively modern history, since the 17th century, there has been a back and forth between China at times when certain warlords within Taiwan were allied with certain Chinese dynasties against others, and at other times when they themselves were subjugated by um, other uh, Chinese um, factions. And in addition to the Chinese, if we come, if we fast forward, the Japanese Empire, famously in a little event which is commonly known as World War II, um, if you go to Asia, then of course the Japanese Empire was uh, colonizing and subjugating uh, neighboring Asian um, countries. 
and um, or attempting to at least and uh, you know Taiwan was one of those so Taiwan uh, fought against the various um, Chinese dynasties that also fought the tribal people carrying these also fought against the Japanese and they also did fight against Europeans as well not the British this time uh, but primarily the Dutch so I believe from the 17th century the Dutch East India Company um, was uh, basically colonizing um, uh, Taiwan or at least parts of um, Taiwan so the Aboriginal people, uh, the tribal groupings, who at various times did ally and come together to fight, and at other times I think were probably divided and, and suffered as a result of that division, as is often the case, uh, and, and is often how we see colonialism works by exploiting uh, tribal divisions. Um, but they were armed with many, many different weapons, and this is one of the key ones, the Lalau, which is, let's be frank, it's kind of halfway between a knife and a short sword and a sort of parang or machete type object okay and we'll again we'll look at its features in a minute they were also armed with other weapons as well um so spears and various types of missile weapon uh, bows primarily um and they also used shields as well i'll talk about that in a second um but probably spears were quite a lot of the time a primary weapon however you have to remember if you're fighting and i'm going to do a video about this soon if you're fighting in um forested or jungle areas then spears and long pole arms are less effective and shorter weapons like this are more um, practical um, but they did have spears and also um, probably from around the 17th century but more increasingly in the 18th 19th and 20th centuries they also had firearms as well and that's where it links to shields so it does seem to be the case that at least originally when these developed these were intended to be used with shields, much the same as we see the Moro Chris used with a shield, um, various forms of uh, Filipino weapons, in fact, and, and of course, um, Chinese and, and, and other Asian, um, East Asian weapons used with shields initially. But then in some cases, in some specific scenarios, people wouldn't carry shields. It might be because they're primarily operating uh, a bow or later on a firearm. And with a firearm, with a muzzle loading firearm, you need both hands to operate it and carrying a shield as well isn't very practical. So very often these did get used by themselves. Um, without a shield but i think probably initially predominantly these were probably backup weapons primarily to spears although not always because we've talked about the forested um, areas and sort of um you know jungles and stuff rainforest it might be that spears weren't very practical in those situations and if you're um, you know skirmishing and moving quickly uh, in an, a raiding party for example through woods then spears might not be a practical weapon at all um, and uh, so these could have very often been primary weapons and I, I think it's probably the case that they were probably usually used with shields a lot of the time shields of various constructions um, uh, I, I won't go into that because it's not something I've researched hugely, but it seems that the shields are usually either of a wooden or perhaps a rattan kind of wicker construction in some cases as well. Not dissimilar to uh, the type of shields we see perhaps in places like Borneo and Sarawak. Um, so. But this type of knife, obviously, in its general characteristics, it being one-handed, relatively short, um, and being, I would say, although you could obviously stab with it, it is primarily a chop or slash centric weapon, has a lot of parallels with other weapons we see in um, Southeast Asia, for example, in you know the Philippines or indeed in Borneo and places like this. Um, now, there is one thing you will have immediately noticed about this knife, rather than actually, well, the whole set as it were and that is the scabbard the scabbard is very peculiar and particular and you'll notice that it's not enclosed it is open on one side and this is a very very characteristic feature and I'm actually unusually I usually put the scabbards aside and look at the weapons I'm gonna put the weapon aside and look at the scabbard because the scabbard is actually very very interesting so essentially it's a flat piece of wood that has been uh, hollowed out to receive the blade and then these um, staples essentially have been put across one side to keep the knife in now that is actually an incredibly so long as you have access to metal to make these staples out of uh, and you could potentially make them with thonging as well these don't have to be metal because notice that the blade 
or rather the edge doesn't actually come in contact it comes in contact with the wood the edge sits against the wood so it doesn't it's not going to run any risk of really cutting through these so you could just bind around here and it would achieve the similar result but undoubtedly occasionally someone puts it in a little bit twisted and actually uh, would accidentally cut through the thing so I suspect that these evolved originally with, um, you know, rattan or, or cord of some kind around here, and then they were found to be uh, liable to damage. And when they had metal to put these staples across, then they thought, well, that's an even better way of doing this. Now, what's interesting is this form of construction is not unique to Tai um, to Taiwan, um, but. Uh, it does have some parallels from some areas quite far, far away. And I'm just going to grab a, an or, original old ethnographic knife here from Sikkim, okay, which I believe is next to Bhutan. And you find similar ones from Bhutan and Tibet as well. And you'll notice that that scabbard has exactly the same kind of construction. In this case, it has bands across rather than staples. But actually, the... Um, you know, the way of making the scabbard is very, very similar. And I can't help wondering, obviously they're a long, long way apart, but I can't help wondering if maybe it's convergent evolution, but I can't help wondering if there's perhaps some ancient world weapon that uh, perhaps spread throughout Asia and ended up certainly with this type of scabbard being emulated in Taiwan and also emulated up in Bhutan and Sikkim. Maybe. It's just a theory. Um, but it is interesting. Now, in terms of practicalities, that means it's relatively easy to make the scabbard. But importantly, if you're in a place that is um, very humid, for example, uh, and you're likely to end up with damp inside the scabbard. Now, a lot of you may say, oh, but if, you, if someone's very humid, very wet, isn't it better to have the blade covered up? And certainly if we come to the British Isles, for example, which are known for our uh, precipitation, um, then indeed in places like Scotland and, and well, all of Britain, really, um, Ireland as well, then you will find that we have fully enclosed scabbards for as long as I'm aware of um, and uh, very often wool lining within the scabbard and leather at the top to, yeah, and rain guards and stuff like this to prevent any damp getting into the scabbard. But um, another, op another, um, another way of dealing with damp in the scabbard is to have the scabbard open so that essentially what this is is this is a way of carrying the knife safely so you're not going to cut or stab yourself or any of your friends um, or any of the rest of your tribe and start some uh, sort of tribal uh, blood feud um, so it's safely contained but water can't get stuck in it moisture can't get stuck in it because there is no in it it's exposed and open that's just an idea anyway um, so I, you know I'd be interested to hear your theories of why you think in certain areas you know Bhutan, Sikkim, uh, Tibet and uh, all the way down in Taiwan as well why that might be why an exposed open scabbard might be a desirable thing I don't think it's just ease of manufacture because you can make an enclosed scabbard from leather very, very easily, but there must be some reason why they didn't want to do that. Um, equally, it's a rigid, so it's a wood cord scabbard. There are scabbards for lots of knives in the world which aren't rigid, where they are just made of leather or, um, you know, even wicker in some cases, and rattan, things like this, um, that are flexible. Uh, this is absolutely rigid, um, so it sort of protects yourself uh, and the blade in that regards as well um, if you fell over and fell on the uh, blade for example um, right now let's actually have a look at the knife so first of all i have uh, looked up a few um, antique and modern day made this so they, these are still made traditionally in taiwan so that's the first thing so alex cheng thanks again he sourced a traditionally made example of these these are still being used as tools perhaps occasionally as weapons as well. And they look exactly the same as examples I could find from the 18th, 19th century. They seem to be made in exactly the same way. The basic features, they do vary slightly in blade shape and um, angle of the tang and 
details of the, the hilt and things like this, but the basic features are a predominantly chopping or cutting blade that is a little bit like a parang um, or a, 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 a perhaps a, not like a bolo, more like a, a, basically a machete, isn't it? It's basically like a machete blade. It does have distal taper, uh, but it's not a very thick blade. Okay, so it, I don't actually have my calipers with me, but at sight, that looks about four, four to five millimeters thick at the base here and it goes down to perhaps three millimeters so there is a little bit of distal taper but not very much it's a simple blade okay it's essentially a, a wedge section more or less flat tapering slightly down and then with an edge bevel which is a single gradient edge bevel and a good nice edge on it and Alex has said that he has seen people chop down trees with these I have no doubts of that and maybe I'll have a go at that myself. I'm certainly going to chop some wood with it and we'll see how well it does but I have every faith that it will do pretty damned well. Um, it's essentially like a short thick machete okay now the tang uh, very clearly disappears into the grip okay and it seems to be secured by one rivet through here which is interesting so it doesn't come through at the other end i imagine it's a stick tang um, that that probably i'm just guessing probably goes to half or two-thirds of the way up inside the grip but there is no sign of it at the other end it's not peened it's not riveted through the grip here at least not as far as i can see it has a ferrule around here very common feature on all sorts of tools everything from shovels uh, to rakes to uh, obviously knives cookeries all things like that to stop the grip splitting up here because when you are chopping something that is an obvious point of uh, splitting of uh, you know of, of tension as it were the grip very very interesting now i've seen antique grips made like this and they're often falling apart so it's fantastic for me to see a new made grip made of this type of um what is it a, a, bamboo I think I think it's strips of bamboo interwoven or perhaps rattan um, perhaps it's rattan um, but they are essentially I'll bring it up here so you can have a good look they're essentially woven like a basket very tightly around the grip and you know it it actually it looks it might look rough to hold when I first thought I, when I first saw it I thought oh my hands are going to get a bit but it's not. It's actually completely smooth. I mean, I can, I could do this all day. Yes, if I did all day, I'd end up with some blisters. But it's a really, really secure grip. And do you know what's also important about it? It's essentially waterproof. It's not going to degrade getting damp or wet in the forest. It's going to stay exactly like that. So the, one of the problems with things like cord or leather is the type of grip you get on them when they get wet does change unless you wax it or coat it in some way. Um, so cord grips especially because when they get wet they can expand and actually get loose um, or they can just get very fat and squidgy and waterlogged. This is not going to get waterlogged, it's not going to change at all. It, it, it is what it is. Okay, So it's a little bit in a sense almost like a traditional plastic uh, grip it's just not going to change if it gets wet. That is that is the grip. And it is a super good grip. It is also oval. Yay! Matt loves oval grips. Um, so I'm not a big fan of um, cylindrical circular grips. Despite the fact that circular grips, cylindrical grips can't be said to be wrong, because we do find them on certain types of sword. Um, for example, we find them on um, uh, certain types of dar, um, Burmese dar and um, uh, crabby and things like that. But the fact is that this is a slightly oval grip. I have to say, so if this was on a show like Forged in Fire, they would probably complain that this was slightly small at the top which is a common complaint for modern knife users, I think, because they're not used to it. Personally, a lot of traditional knives and swords do actually are quite slim up here, and I have no problems with that at all. What's most important to me is that the grip widens towards the butt, and I love a wide butt, I've got to say. Um, it's good, something good to secure to get your hand right onto that butt, and you're not going to slip off, and you don't want to slip off when you're, especially if you're riding right up on the butt, you don't want the hand to come off. Um, so... It's a good secure grip. The weapon's not going to fly out of your grasp. It stays where it is. And even if for some reason your grip did start to fail and you slid up here, it gets fatter and it sort of swells in your, in your uh, hand. So it's less likely to slide off. So great grip. It's quite long, I have to say. Um, but again, that's actually, uh, there are a lot of Asian weapons which have, from a European perspective, an excess of grip. Um, 
Now, whilst conversely there are lots of Asian weapons which have very short grips, things like kukris and tolwas and things like this, but there are lots of um, particularly Southeast Asian uh, weapons, particularly from the Philippines or Thailand or um, uh, Burma, that do have uh, grips that are longer than they need to be. And I think part of this is possibly for balance, because like I've talked about when you're holding a stick, don't have a stick around here amazingly, but when you're holding a stick, if you have some sticking out the back, it gives a better balance. So possibly that's the case. Um, possibly it's just for versatility. It just means that you can choke up um, and use close in for more control, or if you're using it as a tool, if you need to, or if you want to get extra reach, you can hold it right on the butt and you can hit someone from further away. And without having to have a longer blade, you're giving yourself a good few inches of extra reach, which is an advantage in a fight. Um, so that's possible. Um, anyway, it seems rock solid construction. Um, as I say, the tang goes in there some way up to the grip and it is then riveted once through there. We're um, now going to step outside and put this through this pa through its paces. But before I do do, I just want to thank Alex Cheng again for sending this. It's actually a really lovely thing, uh, really convenient. And of course, it's the cultural significance of what this represents. This is, this is the uh, the sort of, um, I suppose, the spiritual and um, culturally culturally beloved weapon of. Taiwan, uh, certainly of the Aboriginal groups of Taiwan, and this is an incredibly important weapon to them, much like the cookery is in Nepal, um, or the uh, the sword, the katana is in Japan. This uh, this is a weapon which has great cultural significance to the Aboriginal tribal groups of Taiwan. And this is the weapon that they carried against various other, uh, you know, invading peoples who were wanting to subjugate them and, and did, um, you know, the Dutch, the Chinese, the Japanese. Uh, and this was carried for centuries, uh, pretty much as far as I can tell, in an unchanged form. Uh, this is a really traditional weapon and these are still being made today. So perhaps something you want to consider adding to your collection. Now let's step outside and see what this can actually do.
So there we go, I think you'll agree that the Lalau actually is a freaking awesome cutter, um, especially for its size. I mean, okay, it's not small, but it's, it's, I don't think it quite qualifies as a um, short sword. It's definitely a big knife, but it cuts really, really well. Um, akin to uh, certain types of prang and brong and things like this that um, I've used in the past, but really very, very good. And this blade's really well made. I mean, there was no um, loss of sharpness to the edge, no you know curling or chipping or nothing like that, of course, on these targets, um, but it will cut wood really, really well. And then it will cut, cut uh, water bottles and uh, milk bottles, milk jugs really, really well. I think I got nine cuts out of that milk jug. So uh, yeah, super, super good cutter. Uh, really, really good. Um, it's only got a slight bit of distal taper to speak of, but on, as I always say, on blades of this size, you don't necessarily need it or even want it because you want a bit of mass out towards the tip. A couple of interesting things I noticed. I'll just put the scabbard down for a second. Um, but a couple of interesting things I noticed. So with the cross section of the grip as you come up here, it becomes quite cylindrical. And a couple of times it did turn a little bit in my hand as I was cutting the wood. Um, and that I found that was because my hand had come quite far up the grip, up towards that ferrule, which whilst being oval is quite cylindrical. Um, and uh, it was turning in my hand a bit. So what I did to compensate was I actually shifted back down to the bottom here uh, where it's even more oval and then I had no twisting in the hand and of course that gave me a you know what maybe two or three inches of extra reach as well uh, so I got more leverage or tip speed in. Um, so I, that was one thing I learned about it during that very brief little experiment. There was another thing I learned about it as well so you might notice I have a band-aid on. Um, I actually have two small uh, cuts in my fingers, which I didn't even notice until I came indoors uh, to, to put some oil on this blade, clean it up, um, and then film this video. And I noticed that I had left some blood on the grip. Uh, and this is because of this bang bamboo grip construction. Now, pluses and minuses. I'm, I've been singing the virtues of this because bamboo is, which I think it is, it might be rattan, but I think it's bamboo. Um, it's obviously very resilient, very tough pretty much waterproof for the purposes of this sort of thing. Uh, great, you don't have to worry about it so much, but it does have quite sharp edges, I have to say. So uh, when you're cutting something really, really tough like wood, with soft um, <laughs> soft hands, person living in a nice cent centrally heated house. I am not a Taiwanese Aboriginal and living in the forest, and so my hands are probably softer uh, than theirs would be, understandably, because I'm not using my hands and processing wood and doing crafts every day, unfortunately. Um, but um, therefore, for plus or plus or minus, you've got to note that whilst it's a very good grip, very secure grip, my hand didn't slip anywhere. It does bite a little bit into the grip. Uh, but in terms of the blade form, I absolutely love it, and I love the forward um, the forward cant, which is similar to certain other um, Asian weapons that we see. A little bit similar to a cookery, but more similar to certain Filipino weapons. Um, and that forward cant means that the edge leads in front of the axis of the normal grip and the hand and really gives a good chopping axe-like effect. Um, very, very good cutter, but then this sweep back gives a nice slash through. Another thing I like as well is it's not so far forward that you still could use this for thrusting in close range. So it is a cut and thrust weapon that you could use in a number of different ways and it's got a fairly considerable reach on it for actually how big it is overall. Um, so once again, thank you very, very much to Alex Cheng. I, I'm sorry that I've had this for a while and I haven't actually got to use it before, uh, but I'll definitely be using it more. I mean, this is an awesome tool as well as a knife. And this is something we often find with ethnographic um, uh, sort of Aboriginal weapons, whether it's as cookeries from Nepal or various weapons from the jungles of Borneo or indeed this Taiwanese Aboriginal uh, Lalo. Um, this is both a fantastic, potentially a fantastic tool. You can clear brush with it. You could um, chop up wood with it. Chops wood really well. Um, or of course you can fight with it very, very effectively as well. It's not uh, heavy like some wood chopping axes are or certain tools are. It is light and nimble and you could very easily use this as a very effective weapon and clearly they did. Uh, so thanks again to Alex Cheng. I hope this has been interesting. 
I literally didn't know about the existence of these before Alex started telling me about them. Check out his article linked below this video and I hope this has been um, an interesting and educational video for you and that this has opened up a new uh, type of weapon and then maybe a new bit of research thing that you can go off and read on the internet more about uh, than I can provide in this video. But thanks for watching. I'll see you back on Scholar Gladiator channel really, really soon for another video on weapons or history or culture. Thanks again to Alex Chen uh, and, in fact, all of the uh, patrons on Patreon who helped make this channel possible, but particularly to Alex, thank you very much for sending this to me. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you and finding out more about these uh, Taiwanese weapons. Thanks, folks, and see you soon. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.